Working Cows Podcast, episode 343. This episode is brought to you by the Patreon supporters. This episode is also brought to you by Ranch Right LLC. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Howdy, everybody. This is Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows podcast, recorded exclusively in the Understanding Egg Studios. Uh, This episode is brought to you by the generous supporters at patreon.com slash working cows. Very much appreciate their generous and faithful support over the years, especially over the last quarter of last year uh, as I was finishing up some seminary courses and uh, just the busyness of the end of the year and that all coming together at the end uh, meant that I haven't been able to release a bonus episode since uh, the end of September. And uh, so I've got a back catalog of about uh, 10 or 15 episodes that'll get released. We're going to get real close to 120 bonus episodes that have been released through there. Uh, Not to mention the, the uh, swag that, the people at $20 per month get, and uh, there will be some fresh swag coming uh, out to them here in the first quarter of 2024, Lord willing. So thanks so much to them and their generous support over the years. Really appreciate it. Uh, looking forward to today on the Working Cows podcast, talking to Cody Spencer. Uh, Cody is a rancher with a, a breadth of experience from Texas to Alberta and uh, working with buffalo and, and cattle and, and all kinds of different places. And uh, he's partnered with Nicole Masters through her Create Coaching uh, service as well as on some different courses. And, and we're going to talk to him about the Grazing for Life course that they've put together today. And so really looking forward to this conversation with Cody Spencer. Cody, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. Welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me. It's going to be a great time as usual. Yeah, looking forward to it. Um, so yeah, last time we talked, you were in a different location doing doing different work, and, and now you're back home in southern Alberta. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about your connection to that land and kind of uh, what your history has been as far as ranch management in southern Alberta? Yeah, my my journey starts in the very extreme part of southern Alberta, a place called Milk River, which is just on the on the Montana border. And I grew up there. Uh, so I'm 34 years old for a little context, and my family had kind of a mixed farm in that area. And when I was a young teenager, my family sold the farm. And looking back, my dad, you know, he was he was wrapped up in the conventional system uh, back then in the 90s. You know, that's that's when Gabe Brown was really just kind of cutting his teeth. There was no such thing as regenerative. There's really was no other way. And uh, there was a couple of bad droughts of 01, 02, I think. And it just made sense to sell the farm. And so as a young kid growing up in that, I mean, that was my life. I absolutely loved it, loved growing up there and uh, loved the connection to the land and for me, I had a few formative experiences, really, uh, we were focused more on the grain side, but my mom would take me out onto, we had this big block of rangeland that stretched uh, west from where our farm laid to the Rocky Mountains, about 80 miles to, uh, well, the Americans and American listeners would be familiar with Glacier Park. Uh, and so the Rocky Mountain Front you know, it stretched in this panorama. And so we would ride up into this, this big basin of the Milk River Valley. And I just remember as a kid being just awe inspired by this landscape, this vast grassland that still existed. And, you know, at that time, I didn't realize how rare that was and how important that land was. And, you know, it's still pretty wild. You get up there and you can see maybe 40 miles in almost every direction. And it looks as if it would 200 years ago. And, you know, antelope, deer, elk, uh, you know, we even have grizzly bears moving back out onto that country. And so there were some of those experiences where 
I became connected to the that grassland much more so than the farming side of things. I just, you know, machinery, big loud machinery and uh, something about the, the ground just never really resonated with me as much as the grassland did. And, and so we sold the farm and we went off, moved away, uh, you know, an hour or so away. It was kind of disconnected from agriculture for about 10 years. And, and then uh, through spending time on friends ranches in the area that I grew up on that Alberta, Montana border, sweet grass country, I be- just became connected back to that place and I couldn't shake it. There was something about wanting to get back out on the land. And so I started working on ranches. I started working on a couple uh, big cattle ranches out in that area and, and realizing, wow, this, you know, this is what I want to be doing with my life. And in that time I had developed a, an affinity for bison. And so, you know, working on cattle ranches, I, I was able to gain livestock experience and really kind of cut my teeth in grass management, but I was always drawn to bison. So I started working on, on some bison ranches and worked my way up into management position on a, on a pretty large operation, started to run my own animals in that herd. And it was, I mean, an incredible experience for someone looking to get started. And, and through that, I really, you know, I think it's this thing where we were infatuated by the animals a lot of the time. And, you know, for a lot of us, it's cattle. For some of us, you know, bison became infatuated with them as a charismatic species. But the more you get into the management, you know, you realize, oh, okay, well, it's actually about the grass. And then, you know, you keep following that down the line. And for me, I I discovered holistic management in about 2015. And, the, you know, that opened a whole new world for me. You know, uh, this different way of managing grassland for all these different outcomes and taking into consideration the people and the finances uh, was was mind-blowing to me. And, and so I kept following that down and so the more, you know, you realize, okay, you're actually managing the grass, eventually it brings you to the soil. You know, you realize that the soil is now the foundation for grass, animal, profit, humans. It's all tied together, right? And so this uh, ranch that I was managing around 2016, 2017, I thought, you know, I thought I had some things figured out in terms of management and, you know, okay, things are starting to click. and. I went to this workshop in 2017, June of 2017, Claris Home, Alberta, put on by Foothills Forage, a great regenerative organization here in Alberta. And I I just knew it was about soil. I didn't know who this woman was and got into this hall of, you know, probably 120 ranchers. All of them looked like you, Clay, and, you know, get in there. And all of a sudden, this this. Kiwi woman from New Zealand steps up to the front and starts talking to everybody about how soil is alive. And, you know, in that moment, I, you know, I had known that, okay, so there are some living organisms in the soil. There's some bugs, there's some things. And yeah, I'm sure they're important. But in that moment, it hit me like a ton of bricks that soil is not only is it alive, but you know, it's a, it's its own super organism, living, breathing super organism that is driving the rest of our ecosystem and our farms and ranches. And so, you know, it was a multi-day workshop and we, you know, we did a classroom session, did out and went out and for anybody who's been in a Nicole Masters workshop, we do the, the soil pit, the Nicole in the hole and look at the trench and the different layers and uh, the roots and all those things. And, after that first day, I was so blown away and so overwhelmed with that information that I couldn't even couldn't even attend the second day. And I just went camping up in the mountains to try to process what what had just hit me. And um, yeah, things things just kind of uh, spiraled from there and literally down into the ground. And I've been chasing that ever since. 
So even in your start in ranching, would you say it was a more conventional start? I mean, you, you said that the family place was a conventional operation, but then as you came into the livestock side of it and said, you know, I want to do this for the rest of my life, even then that was more conventional, a more conventional approach, would you say? Yeah, I would say so. I'd say it's, uh, you know, the the ranch that I got my start on was a, a pretty big place, well, a big place for Southern Alberta, about 50,000 acres and a few thousand head of cattle. And uh, there was kind of s- little smutterings of, regenerative practices here and there in, in terms of moving animals and and resting pastures you know some interesting things around summer and winter ranges which you know could be conventional but i could start to piece together how important plant recovery is and so that you know i think within the quote unquote conventional management system there's there's little bits and pieces in there starting to move in a more progressive way Sure. Yep. And I I think that this whole underground world uh, that has been opening up to us over the last few decades continues to amaze me because I still remember hearing Joel Salatin on the Joe Rogan podcast on the Joe Rogan experience. And and he told Joe, Joel told Joe that in every double handful of soil, there are more living organisms than there are people on the planet. And now we're hearing people like Nicole and others say that in every two teaspoons or tablespoons of soil, there are more living organisms than there are people on the planet. And I don't think that that's because there's it's healthier soil necessarily. I think that's just because our understanding of what's actually going on in there. And that's in the span of five years or less probably, but our understanding of what's going on in that healthy soil is continuing to expand. Uh, Would you agree with that? Yeah, it seems that way. You know, uh, from where I sit, I'm, I am kind of in the middle of this, this world between you know, connecting with the, say, the world's leading, quote unquote, experts, scientists in this field and lear- trying to learn from them. Uh, we had Dr. Chris Nickel move up to Alberta that, a couple of years ago here, learning from people like that who are really at the cutting edge. And and they themselves will say, yeah, that you know, they'll throw out numbers like we know less than 2%, 1%, half a percent. Mm. The point is we know very little and it's and it literally is one of the last frontiers that we have uh you know on the on this planet earth which is to me so exciting um i that comment about joel salatin on joe rogan it just makes me think i think in that episode he encouraged everybody he told everybody that he drinks out of his livestock water trough to get beneficial microbes yeah yeah and eats <laughs> eats carrots straight out of the ground you know and that doesn't work everywhere right i i remember one soil health expert relaying to us at a soil health uh, uh south dakota soil health coalition uh gathering he said you know he was in a carrot farm somewhere in south africa and he pulled this carrot out of the ground and he went to eat it and the guy stopped him and said no you can't eat that and he said why not are you selling these? He said, yeah, but we take them through a process to get them ready to sell because there's been 17 passes over that with some sort of chemical to get it to that point. <laughs> so, you know, it works at Joel's place that you could just put, t- pull a carrot out of the ground and eat it with the dirt on it, you know, and, and his point is that the gut microbiome is related to the soil microbiome. And so it's not dangerous to eat those things because, uh, they're all working together. Well, in in a living system where you've got the right predators there to uh, counteract the you know the other things that are going on under there, it's it's a the soil food web is is in balance. That works in a place where we are trying to uh, exert influence on that in a way that probably we're not qualified to. It doesn't work. <laughs> And it just shows how we, you know, by taking a step back and and just letting nature do its thing and and to to work with that system, we know, you know, back back to that say we know less than one percent or two percent about the soil. The same goes for our our gut biome. And I mean, I know now. Can't my my wife's a nutritionist, and so we we really geek out on this intersection between soil and and human health, and it's it's crazy how we, you know, we discuss a topic and 
she's like, well, that's the same way that it works in the uh, human body. Like, isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. It is. It is cool. Uh, it's all put together. You know, the the word human comes from the word humus, right? I mean, from the soil, basically. And, and according to Genesis, we were created from the dirt, you know, and so there's all these, all of these connections that you start to see uh, that, that are pretty, pretty cool. Can you talk me through a little bit more of <laughs> the, the, um, the moment encountering uh, Nicole Masters and, and her uh, just totally reorienting your perspective to the point that you couldn't attend the second day you had to go camping <laughs> and process yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think what hit me so hard was, that, was I, before that I had never truly internalized the, the gravity in which microbes drive the system. And so what I mean by that is I, I had known about the term of mycorrhizal fungi, fungi, you know, you can, it's like potato, potato, you can name it, whatever you want, fungi, fungi, um, and how these networks in a healthy system are actually, well, one, they're mining minerals, uh, bringing it to the plant in exchange for carbon. They're actually creating water, which is completely mind blowing. They're able to actually create water mm. and bring it to the plant. And they have all these other uh, benefits in terms of building up resilience in, in the, the soil system through creating aggregates and structure in the soil. And it's like, okay, so not only is this not just this little side thing or this, this type of a bug or fungus that is existing in the soil, it's actually running the system. And, and without understanding it and being able to manage for it, and for the health of it and the balance of it that we're actually shooting ourselves in the foot. So, so yeah, it was just that, that moment of, wow, okay, we have this whole another thing and, and, you know, we can cut ourselves some slack because we can't see it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and we, uh, it's, yeah, it's kind of like, Hey, before we invented the microscope, we, you know, we had no idea what we were missing. Right. Yep. Can you talk to me a little bit more about what sets Nicole's approach apart or what are some of the things that are unique in the way that she communicates these things that help kind of kind of make it connect? You know, that's a great question. I think I think some of the uh, aspects of of her and her personality, what resonated with me so much is that she she is I don't want to say she's fearless, but she's willing to go into this foreign country foreign continent uh, in front of a room full of men, conservative cowboy types who, you know, skeptical of what she's talking about. And to be able to get up there and and deliver this information in a way that it doesn't matter who you are, you're going to you're going to internalize that and it's going to it's going to hit you uh, like it did with me. And so I think that's a big part of of her skill and her approach. She she really connects the dots in a truly holistic way in terms of, you know, looking at human health is, is a critical part of the equation as well as animal health. And so, you know, well, and, and plant health for that matter, really looking at everything along the way, all the way down from, from microbes uh, up to, up to human health. And, and another interesting piece that I find is that she's worked in so many different unique types of agricultural systems throughout the world. So it's not just a ranching context. It's not just a cropping context. There's viticulture, there's orchards, there's, you know, all these different types of systems that really, when you get down to it, the principles are, are mostly the same. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And she's got some different ways of communicating or some different, um, matrixes or paradigms for communicating these things that uh you guys are are using in some courses that you're that you have developed and and have released can we talk a little bit about some of those some of the different ways that she's communicating that kind of set it apart yeah for sure uh so we we've just released the grazing for life online course uh on the integrity soils platform so uh, Nicole and I, we've been working on this project this last year and are excited to have gotten it out this December, 2023. And what this is, is a, a deep dive into grazing for microbiology 
in order to support everything else, profitability, animal health, human health. And we really based it off of the foundation of what Nicole has called the five M's. And so the five M's are essentially a triage, which, you know, it's a, it's a framework for viewing our land and our businesses and looking at where might be the weak link and how do we, how do we work on that weak link to move us forward? And so the five M's start with mindset. Mindset encompasses everything we do. Of course, it's, you know, it's our context, it's our paradigms, it's, it's everything. And, and from there, our mindset influences our management and our management decisions that we're making. The three other M's are more soil-based and land-based, starting with minerals. Minerals are a key component of our soils, of course. In grazing, we tend to overlook them because uh, in, in a lot of situations, it's not uh, cost effective to address major mineral imbalances, but sometimes it is, and sometimes it can be a major, major limiting factor to the rest of the production system. Uh, and the third one, or the fourth one, is microbes. Uh, we've touched on microbes a little bit, but microbes, I mean, they are they are literally driving this whole system forward. And without a focus on our micro microbiology, we're we're not going to get where we want to be in terms of developing resilient, low input, high production systems. And the last one is organic matter, which is kind of cheating. She kind of cheated. It's <laughs> organic matter. So it technically is an M. But looking at carbon as the number one uh, mineral, so to speak, carbon's kind of in a, in a league of its own, mm -hmm. you know, being this uh you know, storehouse for nutrients, a home for home and food source for microbiology. And it's close ties with water holding capacity and those types of things. And so we look at the, the we look at an operation through the five M's and seeing where, okay, so where might our limiting factors be? And, you know, often we look at, we look at the human side first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that comes to mindset, right? Um, how we're thinking about that. Uh, could you tell me what, what you mean by mindset? I, that word gets thrown around a lot, uh, especially in business, um, in business books and those kinds of things. And it can get way out into the cosmos <laughs> with that word mindset. But I think that um, you can also talk about it in a different way too. So can you talk to me about what you guys are meaning by that and how you're thinking about the the mindset issue? Yeah, yeah, I think that mindset it's such an interesting one. Uh, you know, we've we've heard all heard the term everything's a people problem. Um when we're looking at improving our our lives and our operations, our land, usually we have we come with these sets of paradigms that we've formed throughout the years that may have served us well in the past but is our is our approach still suitable for what we want to achieve and i find i find it really interesting with people you know it just makes me think of the ranching for profit uh kind of exercise that well in in my particular cohort Dallas was the instructor and and, you know, he talks about thinking, thinking about your operation, thinking about the practices that you employ on your operation. And it's so difficult to look at it from an outside perspective. And then he flips that on its head and say, OK, disregard that. Think about what your neighbor is doing. And then all of a sudden, oh, it's so clear, like we know what our neighbor should be doing. You know, we, we have all these opinions and the, these objectives by being able to look at a situation from the outside it's a lot easier for us to gain clarity, so to speak. And, and so with mindset, I think it's, it's so key that we have defined what it is that we want. We want our, our life and our businesses and our land to look like, which then gives us the foundation to work, work towards that. Right. And when I think about mindset, um, I think about things like the victim mentality or the mm -hmm. imposter syndrome, you know, uh, you know, and I think connected to that imposter sy syndrome is I don't deserve to have good, healthy soils or, you know, I think sometimes those things can even come to play. Does that play into some of what you're talking about with mindset? Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Uh, the victim mindset is is pretty pervasive and that imposter syndrome 
I think everybody has that. I think everybody I know has some form of that imposter syndrome. And I mean, Clay, I'm curious how have how have you dealt with that in your own life and your business? Yeah, yeah. I I think that. Um, <laughs> so I do some bonus content on every episode that I release to Patreon supporters, and when I started really kicking it out consistently. One of the first people I interviewed was Nicole Masters and I asked her, and I usually just do five or 10 minutes after the episode and we capture a little bit of content. And I asked her, I said, um, do you deal with, or do you have any, any tr- tricks or tips for dealing with the imposter syndrome? And she said, of course I do. And I'm like, Nicole Masters deals with the imposter syndrome there. You know, I mean, you, like you said, talking about the, the tip of the spear, the elite of those communicating these ideas to, uh, to the world. And she's telling me that she, uh, with, without a doubt, you know, uh, deals with the imposter syndrome. So I think that's the first thing to recognize is that everybody deals with it. Secondly, I think, uh, the other thing is that as I've been getting invited to come out and speak, uh, in these uh, venues, uh, what I have to continually remind myself of is that nobody here, nobody there to hear you speak is, is hoping that you fail. <laughs> mm. You know, everybody, it's, it's uncomfortable for everybody when you fail. And so you want them to, uh, they want you to succeed and you want to succeed for them, you know? And so I think getting that out of the way is a big part of it. And then I think the other thing is that, we're all bringing our unique set of experiences and ways of turning a phrase and, and, and circumstances to uh, these discussions. And so uh, even though I'm communicating a lot of the same ideas and ideas that I've learned from people like uh, Gabe Brown and Dallas Mount and uh, Nicole Masters and Cody Spencer, and you know, I'm, I'm just communicating things that I've learned from other people, um, the unique way I communicate it might connect with somebody else differently than the way that they do. And so, uh, then I, I can, I can take comfort in that and say, okay, I do have a re a reason for being here and a, and a, and a way to say this that maybe is, is different and that might help somebody. And so it frees you up to, to, to try and, and communicate it. Uh, and yeah, I think those are some of the things that I've learned. That's brilliant. I mean, um, a couple things come up there for me, you know, in our, in our approach, when, and when I say our approach, I, I, uh, studied under Nicole and in the inaugural create program, which, which stands for consciously regenerating ecosystems and agriculture through transformative experience. <laughs> it's a, uh, it's a mouthful, but create program, essentially you could boil it down. It's kind of a master's program for agroecology, regenerative agriculture for, professionals, people who want to be out there supporting the transition, you know, working with producers and lending a hand and and knowledge. And one of the key, the key foundations that this course has been built off of is so much in agriculture. It's all about this expert consultant mentality that there's some person out there, you know, maybe they're working for NRCS, maybe they're working for some university, but they know it all and they're going to come in and they're going to tell you what to do. And, you know, you do it and then everything's going to be good. That's kind of what's got us into this situation that we're in that we need to flip on its head. And so the approach that while Nicole and our create program, which I'm now a part of coaching the successive cohorts, is that nobody has all the answers. There is nobody out there that has all the answers. Nobody understands your context, your land, your vision, your goals better than you do. Uh, There are people out there that can help support you and coach you and maybe bring some knowledge to the table that you don't yet have. But we're really trying to get rid of this idea of the expert because we think it's pretty damaging. And, um, you know, and so so it's been really interesting to to kind of dive into this coaching side of things where it's more about the questions that we're asking than it is about this knowledge that we're spewing to people. And, you know, and Nicole, so, you know, you look at anybody, you look at Joel Salatin, Gabe Brown, Chris Nichols, Nicole, any, you know, anybody that we can name, nobody has all the answers. And that I think is a really empowering 
thing or can be an empowering thing for people that, hey, you know, we're all in this together. And like you say, you're, you know, you're out here talking to everybody, uh, sharing this knowledge with each other, collaborating, doing experiments and sharing with each other. What are the results of those? And I think that's what this is all about versus, you know, hey, I've got the solution and the product for you. And that's all you need. Yep. Yep. And I think that um, it goes back to what you said about your neighbor's ranch, right? The value of having somebody come to your place is that they have a fresh set of eyes and they can look at it objectively and say, why are you doing that? (laughs) Or why are you not doing this? And, (laughs) and it's not, it's not that they're an expert. It's just that they've never been there before. And they, they have legitimate questions about what, what is going on here and why is it happening this way? And, and maybe that's the, the missing link and all of a sudden make that one change and, oh, this is why things were not progressing as quickly as they might have otherwise. And, and so I think that's, that's kind of what you're talking about with coaching and, and asking questions, right? Yeah, absolutely. Having, a, having somebody that you can trust as a sounding board, you know, just to have a simple discussion and just be, be there. You know, for me, I find that some of the most powerful times that I have is being just being out with somebody, whether it's on their their land or somebody else's land, but being out on the land and just observing, uh, being curious and asking questions. I think that's where a lot of the the aha moments and the progress comes from. Mm-hmm. Like I can't even tell you how many times that uh, you know visiting a new property and just for me getting a a new perspective on you know what's even possible. It just it can completely transform your life. Let's take a quick break and hear a word from our sponsor today, Ranch Right LLC. Does a year's worth of tax prep stand between you and being able to send things to your accountant? Are you tired of email after email asking for documents that you don't know how to find? Are you wondering exactly how much money you're going to owe the IRS this year and have no clue how to even start to figure that out? We've been there, but you don't have to. Hire Ranch Right today and know where your business stands. After all, taxes are a part of life, but RanchRite helps you with data entry, bookkeeping, gives you reports that you can make sense of, and helps with a realistic outlook of what your business needs this tax season. Visit LLC today and cross tax prep off your list. So that kind of covers the, the first M, uh, just a brief overview of the first M, which is mindset. Uh, can we move on to the second one, which is management? Yeah. And so, you know, mindset, uh, mindset informs management. And so our management decisions spin out of, you know, how we're, how we're thinking about and relating to our land and our businesses. And so, you know, if we're in a, if we're in a frame of mind, that is sort of this fight or flight for lack of a better term, where we're just on, you know, in survival mode and we're just trying to grind through and, and make things happen our management decisions tend to be reactionary versus proactive and you know by being able to to get that ma- that mindset piece right and get our vision in place uh you know there's there's all sorts of different ways you can approach it ranching for profit has the mission and vision holistic management has the the context or the holistic goal that can help uh, help guide these management decisions. I think there's value in all of them, um, but getting clear on what it is and you know where you want to get to will allow you to to think a little bit more objectively about what is the right management to, to decision to make in that context. And and so we're talking, you know, from a human quality of life standpoint, uh, operational from a business profitability standpoint. If we don't, if we're not clear on that, we're going to keep making uh, decisions that, you know, we're we're in a certain pattern, a way of of doing things, and we are going to try to stay comfortable in where we're at. Humans are generally creatures of of habit, right? So to step out of our comfort zone is challenging. So, yeah, I think I think the the biggest piece of that management is getting the mindset right and getting clear on what we want to where we want to get to. Yeah. Yep. And, and then, um, in, within the five M's, uh, the management piece, does it include 
uh, any, it, it's more, it, does it include any practices or any, any ideas about these are the things that should be included at a minimum or any, any of those kinds of things? Yeah. And again, it's not prescriptive of what practices you should be, you should be taking, but when you're looking at say the other, the other M's, your minerals and your microbiology and your carbon, that might inform some other management changes that you might make in terms of, you know, if we're talking grazing, then it might be around recovery period is a big one that we run into a lot. Um, you know, uh, we can dig a little, d- dig a bit more into that. It's one of my favorite talk topics because I think it's a piece that we're, you know, we're, we're missing, so to speak, or, or there's a lot of opportunity to get that recovery period, right. Which will empower biology and, help drive carbon down into the soil. And so, you know, what are the, what are the management pieces that we need to have in place in order to get the right recovery period to meet those other objectives? Yeah. I I think that that recovery period piece is especially interesting because it changes so much uh, based on latitude, not just Mm -hmm. rainfall, but also latitude. And I think that there are uh, places in the world in Canada and especially Northern Canada uh, that get these really long daylight hours in the summer. And that goes into a, I think is a big part of why their recovery periods work the way that they do, where they don't necessarily work that way everywhere. Do do you get what I'm saying? Well, can you elaborate on that? I'm curious. I just think that longer daylight hours mean more recovery can happen in that area in a given day. And so they're, their recovery days are different <laughs> in Northern Canada. I'm thinking of Steve Kenyon. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of Tom Kravitz um, who are way North. I mean, Steve's North. I think both of them are North of Edmonton. And so uh, that's quite a ways up there. And so they have these really long daylight hours where they're crushing more hours of recovery into a day than we can. And so when they talk about a, a 35 day recovery period, that's a lot of more, a lot more hours than it is in, at my latitude. And so I think we can talk about those numbers, those hard numbers, and, and maybe they're not communicating the same thing everywhere. And so I think it, that's more of a, that's more of a, just a, a comment on the fact that it changes so much given your zip code and nobody's zip code is exactly like anyone else's. And so we have to, that goes to the context issue, right? We have to really take into account what is our context and what, what does the history of this land tell me I need to do uh, before I can worry about trying to do what somebody else is doing. Yeah, that's super interesting. You know, I hadn't really thought of that. I, I, I've, uh, definitely considered the idea of that, you know, one day of recovery is not necessarily equal to the, another day of recovery, but, um, that that's a good point because, you know, you start to get up, we've got this area in Northern Alberta and, and, uh, British Columbia called the peace river country. And it's the furthest North, uh, where agriculture essentially exists on any sort of a scale in North America. And they get some pretty long days in the, in the summertime. And so you're right, you know, your growing degree days or your, your ability to capture sunlight is way different in during that time. And then, you know, you get the flip side of that in the wintertime where you might not be able to, to grow much in those shoulder seasons. So Mm -hmm. the nuance of context is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And it changes, uh, again, it changes everywhere. And, and, and I think that the, one of the missing pieces of context is again the history of what's happened here before I got here. Has it ever been tilled? Has it ever been planted to a to a non native species? You know, and 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 for a large portion of North America, it has, and so that completely changes the way that that management is going to be. Uh, how we're going to interface with that that ground from a management perspective in a lot of in a lot of ways. Um, so yeah, I think that's an interesting one. I, I want to talk a little bit about minerals too. The the third M that you mentioned, uh, if it's okay to move on, and we I mean, again all of these could be an episode or a series of episodes in their own right. But uh, I, I would like to talk about minerals and kind of some of what you're thinking about when you talk about the five M's being and that being one of them. And from my perspective, and I think you alluded to it, one of the harder ones to influence. Am I right? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, when we, especially when we talk about the landscapes, a lot of the landscapes that we're working on and a lot of the listeners are on, say in the Western, Western part of North America, where it's pretty dry, it's pretty expansive and you're not going to go run a piece of equipment across a hundred thousand acres of sagebrush type of thing to address a mineral imbalance. And so the flip side of that is, you know, by having an idea of where our mineral minerals are at by soil testing, um, we can at least identify some limiting factors that we might have. You know, when we start to look at some of the, the really important minerals like calcium, if we have a, a major calcium deficiency, then we're going to have issues with empowering microbiology. So with low calcium, fungi can't do what they what they need to do. And so that could uh, that could help inform different management uh, decisions that we make on the land. You know, in some in some situations, it might make sense to address these uh, these situations. I think a lot about uh, hay ground and you know ir- irrigation, sub irrigated meadows, uh, pivots, and some of those things. That's where it really starts to make sense to address those mineral deficiencies. You know, you've heard it said, uh, you know, Gabe and Alan and Alejandro, some of these guys talking about how focusing on our best ground first will provide the highest return. So thinking about, okay, if we're going to address a major mineral imbalance, what is our ability to maybe get some water on that? And um, so looking at those major deficiencies uh, from, you know, the, the macro nutrients all the way down to things like boron and uh, boron is critical to governing the translocation of sugars down from the plant into the root. And so say if we have a deficiency of boron, we might not be flowing carbon through that plant and into the soil. Uh, The analogy is that it's boron is the trap door uh, for carbon. And so, you know, things like that. And, and if we're testing for some of these things and we see that, okay, there's an imbalance here that we might be able to address with maybe a foliar foliar application in, uh, in an irrigated or higher production system that can be an option or even just having an idea that, wow, this is way out of whack. And by putting energy and money into this piece of ground, we might not see a return at all. You know, so we've done some, some testing on uh, large extensive rangeland where we see these major imbalances in particular of calcium to magnesium and too high of a, a ratio of magnesium to calcium creates a really structurally tight and compacted soil. And you can address that through things like gypsum and, and some of those things to flush the magnesium out. But again, are we going to do that across extensive dry rangeland? Probably not. So, you know, and as far as investing in infrastructure on pieces of ground like that, that might help inform where we where we invest our money back to. Let's focus on our best ground first and see how we can make these two, three X returns in a short period of time. Yeah. And and can can you talk a little bit about some of the, th- the ways that those things would get applied? I mean, if you if it comes back and says, yeah, this is going to be worth the investment. Um, and foliar applications. Are we talking compost teas? Are we? What are we talking about there? Is and maybe the range is pretty wide. But so when we talk about um, applications, you know, there's there's def- everything from the conventional like granular granular application with the spreader, depending on what you're, you know, what you're trying to put out on the land. So you start to talk about some of these compost teas, and uh, Nicole's kind of famous for these slurry sprayers. You know, you mm-hmm. get a trash pump and you get uh, some sort of a tank and create a vortex. And essentially, you can pour everything in the kitchen sink into the into the tank and keep it in suspension and shoot it out a, uh, you know, really coarse nozzle, like a quarter, three, three eighths of an inch nozzle and and get it out on the land in that in that form. And I think that that's got utility in a lot of situations. There's been some people that are that have gotten creative with those systems you know getting old i think it was steep charter in montana i got an old army truck and and a big trash pump and and was able to get some stuff out on on the land i think he was doing vermicast out of that and 
Um, so that's definitely an option again, you know, I, I think, uh, I think that that's still in the trial phase. Like it, there's still so much that needs to be done as far as different applications on different types of landscapes. We've had, uh, uh, in our create cohort, uh, who, you know, we've got a quite a broad, uh, group of people who have come through the create program and work on different landscapes. And we have, a uh, an amazing woman named Annie Overland in Colorado, who she would actually be a great guest for you to have. She's a, she's a rancher, uh, Colorado state range extension person. And, uh, I mean, woman of all trades kind of thing. And she did this cool experiment with Johnson Sioux compost, high fungal compost, where they, they seeded this field that they called the cheat grass field on this, uh, West uh, Colorado foothills ranch. And, you know, you can imagine what was growing there. Right. And so when we look at, uh, if we were to test that, so I, I don't remember if I saw the soil tests or not, but those low succession weedy type annual species generally favors bacterial conditions or the bacterial conditions favor those types of plants, kind of chicken and egg thing. Uh, what we want to do is generally shift that, balance of fungal to bacteria ratio back towards the, you know, more balanced. And so uh, she trialed a Johnson Sioux compost and just on a very light rate on this, they seeded a cover crop, essentially like run of the mill, warm season cover crop. And she sprayed a couple patches with a backpack sprayer. And the, basically the entire field, nothing came up except where she sprayed that mm. light amount of Johnson Sioux and the cover crop, the sorghum sedan is just exploding. And so it's, it's quite interesting to see, okay, what's, what's actually going on there. And, um, you know, so I think there's a lot of experimentation that still needs to happen, uh, in terms of applying those amendments, but there's, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of possibility out there. And right. so uh, back to your, back to your original question, uh, pivots, center pivots are an amazing opportunity to be able to get you know, get inputs into that water and get it out onto the land, you know, with a piece of infrastructure, you're already running. Uh, that's a big deal. And, um, you know, unique things like if you have flood irrigation, you've got ditches, you know, you have access to some high quality vermicast, create a tea bag with a burlap sack and put some, put some vermicast out and just let it sit in your ditch and, let the water carry those microbes out onto the land. Mm -hmm. You know, it's essentially no cost and uh, except the cost of the vermicast and the bag. And so some of those, some of those things, people are getting creative with ways to do it. I think ultimately our high, you know, as grazers, our highest leverage is our animals. Right. And so using, just thinking about our, our animals as walking nutrient cyclers, uh, they're, they're going to do a lot of the work for us, but but uh, in, especially in terms of the minerals, uh, if we, you know, we, we can find little leverage points to to address some of these things in conjunction with our good grazing management. So these these amendments, would they be addressing mineral issues uh, or 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 not? It depends. You know, yeah. it depends on, you know, your con. obviously back to context. Everybody hates that. All oh, it depends on your context. But, yeah, I mean, if you're if you're looking to. Uh, you know, if you've got this major calcium deficiency and by applying, you know, appropriate amounts to actually boost up your, your available soil calcium, then yeah, you might be looking to, to actually feed the soil. And some of these might just be foliar applications where you're feeding the plant. Right. Would you say that there's a common, um, a common set of circumstances that has led to a major mineral imbalance or deficiency? Um, or is it, I mean, it, it, it depends. <laughs> well, I think the big one that jumps out to me is that, you know, especially when we're looking at our, our positively charged minerals, our cations our major cations like calcium being one of them, uh, magnesium, potassium, sodium, some of those ones, we, we, they, they bind to the, the clay colloid in the soil and also organic matter. And so as we've eroded a lot of our ground and got rid of a lot of our organic matter through whatever practice we might be talking about, a lot of our nutrients go with it. 
So it's really, I think, in, on our, in speaking on our grazing systems, that's a lot of it where we've ex, we've overgrazed and we've exposed bare ground and, you know, wind and water have taken away our nutrients and we're left with we're left with subsoil. I think that's that's the big one that jumps out for me. Sure. Yeah. And that transitions nicely into the fourth M, which is organic matter, I believe. I'm not sure which one comes first, if it's uh, if in in the typical re- recitation of the five M's, if it's organic matter or microbes. But uh, uh, which would you say, which would you like to tackle first? <laughs> well, let's go. Let's go with organic matter because we're on that. We're on that topic. And um you know it's you know, we hear about it over and over again carbon drives the system carbon's the currency of the system while i well while, while i have that thought one of our fellow create students who is now uh understanding egg consultant brian doherty mm. he uh he just came out with a three-part series on carbon as the uh you know, as the currency for our egg systems. And it really, in that, in those three blog posts that he posted, he gives a real novel perspective on carbon and, and, and thinking about it in a way that we're, you know, I haven't really heard of yet. So I'd encourage everybody to look back. I think it was two weeks ago, he started releasing those. So in December 23, but yeah, carbon's really driving the system and it, and it's what's going to, provide the resilience through the you know the inevitable drought years that we have in terms of water holding capacity you know most of us have heard some of those stats around one percent increase in organic matter on a loamy soil type equals 20 20 000 gallons of of water per acre so i mean really it can't be understated and so when looking at our own systems thinking okay are we building carbon or are we losing carbon Soil testing and getting a baseline for where we're at is is pretty important. I think that can help with our management. But even just more simply, digging more holes in the ground and and looking at that layer of that first few inches of of soil and and comparing it, dig it out in the middle of a pasture, check that out, and go under a fence line that maybe hasn't been grazed or an area that's been rested or maybe treated a little bit differently. And if you see it a big difference in those two sites that, that might be telling you that your management is, is losing carbon or, or past management to that land. Mm, so then yeah. from there that can help influence different management strategies to, to build back that carbon. Sure. And kind of in connection with that, and you mentioned it a couple other times, do you guys have some favorite tests that you like that you keep coming back to as far as uh, testing soils and, and just making decisions about what to do next? Yeah, I think we like to, you know, there we like to remain a little bit broad. Like there's a bunch of labs out there like Ward and Regen Ag labs that do good uh, conventional uh, mineral testing that gives you that organic matter loss on, on ignition. Basically, you're you know, you're burning out the soil and, and the more organic matter burns up, the higher uh, percentage of organic matter you got in your soil. Um, so I think those are valuable. And and looking back to the mineral piece in those getting a total nutrient digestion test or even a geochemical assay will allow you to to see you know what is truly in this in this bank of soil because a lot of the conventional tests they're not taking into account how certain minerals like phosphorus actually bind up and complex with other minerals and so that might be in the soil, it just might not be available to the plant until we can get biology working and empowered to extract that and break, you know, because fungi can actually break those bonds through certain acids and then make it available to the plant. So if you have an idea, you know, and, and understanding egg, Gabe, Gabe have, they've done a lot of work on this showing, hey, you know, most soils have more than enough minerals, in, you know, in that soil to actually produce what you want to produce for a very long time. It's just a matter of empowering that biology. Now, in terms of the biology side of things, um, you know, there's PLF, PLFA tests, which people are familiar with. Um, there's more of the soil food web microscopy side where, you know, people are actually looking through the microscope and 
counting the microbes. And so, you know, a lot of our a lot of our coaches use a lab out of Oregon called Earthfort. So that's a really good lab to use. Um, but I think, you know, not getting hung up on on certain tests as like the be all and the end all because it's really evolving and um it's more just to be able to track your consistency over time first address you know address any glaring deficiencies that we see but to be able to track that progress over time and inform that management is pretty important i mean there's some cool there's some cool biology tests some uh, microbial dna type stuff coming out from uh companies like biomakers where you know they're actually looking at all the different families of microbes and what they do in the soil. Mm. Um, you know, how relevant is that for us in our grazing operations? You know, I think, I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting. And as things evolve, there's a lot of opportunity to have that help inform our management. But um, yeah, so some of those ward and regen in, in the U S are, are some of the bigger ones I'd say. And then as we, uh, finish the five M's anyways, we come to the last one, which is microbes. Uh, talk to me a little bit about some of the things that you guys are thinking about there. Yeah. And another thought that ties back into that soil testing question that ties into microbes is a really important test is the wet aggregate stability test. So essentially how well are your soil aggregates forming and how stable are they in the soil in, in a rainfall event and, and, you know, essentially, are they providing a home for microbes and do they have the ability to store water so that, you know, that's a really important thing to look at and gives us an idea of how well our fungi are, are working for us. And, you know, you don't want to say that one, say, class of microbes is more important than the other. But, you know, what we find kind of across the board is that in a lot of our egg systems, grazing, cropping, you know, the more disturbance we have, the less fun, less beneficial fungi we have and more bacteria we have. Now, of course, bacteria are essential. They're, they're everywhere. They're unavoidable. You know, we're not going to get rid of them. We need bacteria, but it's just that imbalance between the two that, that really kind of collapses our soil structure and creates this kind of uh, self-perpetuating cycle of lack of water infiltration, lack of breathing. You know, a lot of people don't realize that healthy soil should be about 60 plus percent air, you know, and that's back to that aggregation, creating those pores and those, you know, those spaces for water and air to, to exchange. And so looking at how do we, how do we get that fungi back into balance and Earlier in the podcast, you alluded to the broader soil food web. And so looking at the larger predators like protozoa and nematodes, which their role is essentially to cycle a lot of the nutrients that exist within that bacteria. Because the bacteria, you think of it as like little tiny little balls or bags of fertilizer. They're full of nutrients. And if they have no means to be consumed and and poop back out into the system, then it's just kind of bound up. And that's, that's what we call the constipated soils. And so these soil predators, they're a pretty important piece. And, and a lot of the biology tests, they look at, you know, our protozoa, our nematode species, and are, are they there? Are they functioning? Important point to note on those predators is that they need a, they need a water film to be able to actually swim through the soil and hunt the bacteria and consume them. And so if, you know, if we're not managing for higher water holding capacity, then that piece of the soil food web is, is unable to basically do its job. And then the flip side of that, we're able to manage for higher water holding capacity, higher carbon, higher microbial activity, then those predators are able to just keep that cycle humming, keep that, keep that thing humming. And another piece of that, uh, that we touch on in the course is the rhizophagy cycle, which is a pretty exciting development in, uh, in microbial science from Dr. James White over the last decade or so, where essentially, you know, we've come to realize that, that plants are actually ranching microbes. And so <laughs> as they, they are photosynthesizing, you know, they're taking that sunlight and that water and they're, 
creating sugars to, of course, feed their own growth, but they're pumping a lot of that through into the into the rhizosphere, the the zone immediately around the roots, and bacteria and microbes flock to that zone and they flock to that to those exudates as a food source. And so what's happening then is those bacteria, they're consuming that, they're full of nutrients, then the plant actually sucks up that ba- bacteria through the very end, the tip of the root. They suck it into the root. And then once it's once the bacteria is in the root zone, they they strip the bacteria of its nutrients, eject it out the side of the root, which creates a root hair, and then it goes back into the soil. And it can actually repeat that process over and over again. So, I mean, it's quite quite amazing to see like, wow, okay, we had no idea. Now this is actually, this process is happening. How do we empower it? How do we empower photosynthesis on our land to be moving more energy through that system? And we're talking, you know, we're talking exponential gains. And that's all kind of things that we've noticed before, right? Like you want your roots to look like dreadlocks, you know, and why is the, why is the dirt clinging to the root when you pull it up out of the ground. Well, it's got these root hairs on it that are holding on to those things. And so all of those things that, you know, we've been recognizing before, these are commonalities in healthy systems, but now we have some of the data to explain what's actually at play behind that. Is that, would that be an accurate understanding? Yeah, I think so. And, and we're just at the beginning, right? We're just at the beginning. And so that's, that to me is what's so exciting. So for people out there listening who who are interested in this stuff, like, I mean, we, you know, there's so much opportunity for producers to be involved in this in this research and, you know, to help discover what is what is really possible. And I think for me, what is so exciting about it is this provides a pathway for the next generation to be able to step into these systems. You know, this viability of Egg operations, is, you, you hear it everywhere, right? Like what's going to happen uh, as these operations become less and less viable? And, and what path is there for somebody that's, say, our, you know, our age or younger to get into agriculture? I think this is it. Right. Yeah, for sure. So all of these things, these five M's plus the 10 grazing principles play a big role in the grazing for life course. Could you talk to me from Integrity Soils? Could you talk to me a little bit about the design of that grazing for life course? Yeah, so we've got uh, 11 modules to work through and it's all on it's all online a platform called Thinkific and and the way we've structured it is Nicole and I have recorded videos out into out in the field on each topic. And so there's a video component, there's a text component, and then there's an activity for each module that, uh, you know, we, we encourage you to go out and do a trial or there's, you know, different activities for each module and then report, either report back or some of them are, uh, say, a longer term trial that you're going to be doing throughout the grazing season type of thing. So you'll monitor that as the as the year goes on. And everything is work at your own pace. You can come back to it, uh, you know, over the course of a few weeks or a month or, you know, take the course over and over. And really the way we've designed it is this is a, this is an add on. This is the, the next level in terms of grazing to the soil health foundations course and the soil health masterclass course, which Nicole has put out in the last few years. And so really getting that foundation uh of soil in general and we've covered a lot of it in this episode but deepening that understanding of soil function and if you want to take it to the next level in the master class and then really get diving deeper into the grazing specific side of things sure is where the grazing for life uh course shines very good and is there in is there some opportunity for interaction or community that is connected to these courses at all well so if you, if you go through this course, you know, and you're going to be learning a bunch of things and it's going to have you thinking differently about your own operation and what management changes you can make. If you go through this course and you feel like, wow, OK, you know, I'm ready to make some changes, but I I would like some support with this. Uh, I would encourage you to reach out to me or to we have a what's called the Fe- Integrity Soils Fellowship on the website where all of our, our coaches are listed on there. And so depending on 
you know, your type of uh, enterprise or your geography, there might be uh, one coach that's a better fit for, for the other. But I, you know, I'd encourage everybody who's listening. If you feel so inclined, you can reach out to me directly. Sure. Sounds good. And we will, we'll list some contact information in the show notes page for today, uh, which I think is workingcows.net slash 342. Three workingcows.net slash 343 will be the show notes page for today. So we'll have some links there to get a hold of Cody and the Integrity Soils team and, and the, of course, the Grazing for Life course as well. So uh, anything else that you wanted to cover today? I mean, you, you mentioned the Create uh, course a little bit or the Create um, cohort a little bit uh, throughout the, the episode, but would you like to drill down a little bit more on that uh, as we look towards wrapping up? Yeah, I think so. That's uh, thanks for bringing that up because so we're we're in the middle of the third create cohort and we're we're currently working with a group of students based out of the UK and across Europe, which has been really interesting to see. Okay, you know how are they doing agriculture over in Europe? And in some ways, it's it's vastly different, but in most ways, it's very much the same uh, to the way that we do it over here in North America. But Next year, I think we're we're looking at doing it here in North America again. I've heard some rumblings about Create Yellowstone. <laughs> so I would encourage anyone who who is interested in doing this work and supporting producers in transitions to regenerative agriculture, and you really want to take that knowledge and understanding to the next level and, and really um, focus on building up your yourself and your capacity to to make a difference i would encourage you to take a look and apply to the program and see what happens um it's you know it's life-changing i don't i don't think we had a single student who's went through the program and haven't had their life changed for the better and you know i'm one of those people so uh keep an eye out take a look on the integrity soils website i think there's already an an intake for people who are interested but uh, we're going to be doing North America again next year, and it's going to be really exciting. Could you talk a little bit about the structure of that course or, or that cohort as well? Yeah, absolutely. So generally, there it's about a 36-week program, so you know the better part of a half a year. And uh, each week is focused on a major topic, uh, whether it's whether it's a major mineral or it's uh, it's microbiology. It could be um, more focused on the human side, the behavior change. Uh, that's a big focus of the CREATE program is how do we empower people? How do we, you know, how do we work through paradigms and and support people in these changes? And so each, each week there's multiple uh, topics that we go through and we have a weekly class, a weekly Zoom class. Usually the first week of the program is all in person on a, you know, they up to this point they've been on some pretty, pretty cool notable operations we ours was on white oak pastures in the first year and mm. last year we were at cottonwood ranch in nevada and this year althorpe estate so uh, we'll see where where it's going to be in person next year and and that first week is really pretty powerful to get everybody together on the land and set the stage for this this learning that everybody's about to go through and and then we all go our separate ways and we continue learning online throughout that 36 weeks. Um, and a big part of that is, uh, you know, one-on-one coaching with, with the coaching team and Nicole and I, Megan Lannon is one of the, uh, Nicole's, uh, go-to right-hand woman. She's out of Barney Creek, Barney Creek livestock in Livingston, Montana. She's the, <laughs> she's the one that's really drove the create program to the finish line. And so that you get one-on-one work with coaches and supporting you in your, Essentially, you do a project where where you'll work with a client and you'll do soil tests and you'll you'll uh, figure out what you know, where where do you does this client want to go and you'll support them on that journey. And so some people come in uh, completely green in this work and others have been, you know, multi-decade consultants with a ton of experience. And so anybody who feels like they're ready to take their knowledge and experience to the next level, I would say apply. Yeah, that sounds great. Sounds like a great opportunity. Uh, Cody, I really appreciate your time today. If, if there isn't anything else I missed or, or something else you wanted to say, I'll, I'll just say thank you for your time today. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Clay. Appreciate it. 
Very much appreciate Cody and his time and his perspective and in the Grazing for Life course. If, if you're interested in the Grazing for Life course, you can sign up for it at integritysoils.com. You can use the code WORKINGCOWS20 for uh, a discount if you're interested in that. So please go and check that out and use the code WORKINGCOWS20 for a discount. We'll be coming your way real soon with another episode of the Working Cows podcast. Not exactly sure what that conversation will be just yet, but we will have another episode coming your way real soon on another episode of the Working Cows podcast. We'll see you then. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.